roughly the order I'm going to be talking about these. Uh, we're going to start talking about intelligence, some background assumptions, then we'll get to the heart of, of my talk, which is causal relations, reasoning, and learning uh, versus seed programming. Um, so just to start off with the main top level goal here, we are all here probably because we want to create a general machine intelligence. And the way I, I think about this and a lot of my collaborators is that an agent uh, is the composition of a controller and the body which acts as the interface to its world or its task environment in which it achieves complex goals and where there's plenty of novelty. This is the relation between the knowledge that the agent has or the controller and the uh, environment itself. So um, we assume complex task environments. We're not really interested in toy environments. Uh, and that makes the challenge harder, but more fun. Um, in our target task environments, we are talking about the existence of large numbers of variables with all sorts of relations and transformation functions that create complex spatiotemporal patterns. And again, uh, novelty is common, that is, things that the controller or the agent has not experienced before. So we, we kind of have to start here at the top level um, to talk about what kinds of theories we have so far. Um, because uh, any learner, any, any system that's trying to figure, th figure things out to learn something new, has to deal, uh, ha comes into a, a world with a lot of, uh, there are a lot of sides to the learning that we know from, from both you know, human uh, experience and in the animal kingdom that, uh, that involve these five things that we have put here in, um, in my PhD student has put into a pentagon which makes it really nice to draw diagrams like this now. So we have a learner that is doing a task in some sort of a task environment. Um, and to, to get good at this task, it needs training. Uh, it may or may not be able to use the uh, guidance of a teacher, but in order to know what a learner knows, uh, we test it. And there's all sorts of relationships between these to, be, to have a proper theory uh, of, of for doing AI, we would actually want a theory for all these corners. We would want a proper learning theory, a proper task theory, a proper training theory, a teaching theory, and a testing theory. And they should all be within the same uh, uh, conceptual space, uh, sharing background assumptions. So what do we have so far? Well, we have the non-axiomatic reasoning theory by Pei Wang, which is really, in my opinion, the only coherent broad theory uh, of, of learning. Um, anything else is, is either, ha either half-baked or has huge gaping holes. Now, just don't, don't take my word for it. You, you can bring up some, some questions and comments, uh, and hopefully we'll get to talk about that. Um, on the task side, uh, myself and my colleagues uh, have started to try to build a task theory from a fairly fundamental level, um, but I will put a very small, uh, these are not relatively uh, appropriate. Uh, I just want you to see the, the green mark here. There, so someone's working on this, um, and uh, as far as I know, uh, with, with this uh, approach we are taking, uh, we're, we're, we're feeling quite alone, although I'm, I'm sure we're not all completely alone. Um, on the testing side, do we have any theory? Not really, no. We have a bunch of ideas, uh, Wozniak's coffee test, the toy box problem, Piaget MacGyver room. You know, the list is very long, IQ, IQ tests, etc. But there's no really any theory behind it. Um, so I will put a question mark there and I will put a question mark on the others as well. You know, really uh, to, to get pr 
proper uh, grounding for AI, we will need to fill all of these theories up. Um, now, there is a really good definition of intelligence. And if you haven't read Pei Wang's paper from late last year on the, on the definition of a, AI, I, I strongly urge you to read it. It's brilliant. Uh, in short, this is the compact version adaptation with insufficient knowledge and resources. Rather than going into detail on that, and I'm, I'm assuming, actually, I'm guessing, uh, and I know for a fact, uh, many of you have already read that stuff uh, backwards and forwards. I will replace that with my own favorite way of saying that same thing uh, for the moment, figuring out how to get new stuff done. So if you were ever confused about Pei's theory, it, that's exactly what it is. This is what it means. Figuring out how to get new stuff done. Um, figuring out new stuff, figuring out new, it basically means something's missing. You don't have everything. You don't know everything, which is the assumption of insufficient knowledge and resources. Um, it's new because you haven't done it before, or certainly not exactly the same way. So, so that's that part. Now, get stuff done. And this is really speaks to the heart of, 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 of my, uh, short presentation today, to get stuff done, you need to make something happen. And if you have any, any preconceived ideas of what that stuff is supposed to be, you already have an assumption of the existence of causal relations. Because even if you know, know exactly what you wanna do, if you don't have the slightest clue or even the possibility uh, of knowing how to get that done. If you don't have some building blocks that allow you to start, you won't get them done. In, a, in any large task environment, the combinatorics completely preclude a random search or even systematic exhaustive search. Um, but why non-axiomatic reasoning? Uh, if there are some uh, people here who are new to, to Pei's uh, writings this, and, and, and the work on NARS by the NARS team, you might be wondering, you know, what's this big deal about non-axiomatic reasoning? So uh, non-axiomatic comes from the fact that there are no givens. When you do new stuff, you cannot possibly know if it will work. So how can anyone act in such a world? Well, that's just, Stay, stay put and, and we'll get to that. Reasoning, why do we need reasoning? Can't we just do it in some other way? Well, frankly, uh, not at the moment because there are no known solutions other than reasoning for dealing with giant complex environments. If you have a world that is even partially rule oriented or rule governed, then you're only chance of getting anything done in, in a semi-efficient way is through reasoning. It's the only way. So how does that proceed? Well, and this is, now we're getting closer to the heart of my talk. Uh, we do that via hypothesis generation and testing. Modeling the world from experience and then checking how well we did. So learning means modeling, and there's no way around that. Um, an agent controller is a modeler. If you have an environment uh, made up of variables, uh, 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 transformation functions, relations, and initial state, um, uh, the controller here implements a process that models experience. So what is involved with this loop? So you got a sensor and you got an actuator. The sensor can measure some things and the actuator can affect some things. So this is the loop. Um, well, uh, Conant and Ashby's good regulator theorem states 
that every good controller of a system must capture a model of that system, or as they say, it must be a model of that system. What does a good controller mean here? Well, actually, it's a very useful concept. A good controller actually achieves its goals. And uh, I will remind you that it's not really a controller if it has no goals, uh, then it's more like an art piece. So some of the requirements on the controller um, are listed here. Um, on the job learning, on the job modeling, on the job verification of the quality and the usefulness of its knowledge. Through reasoning, because this is really the only way that we know so far, the most efficient way to do anything with information where you don't have time to check everything. Which of course, as you know, if you've done any machine learning is, is very, very often the case, in fact, in modern so-called machine learners. Um, so learning, we're, we're throwing in one more thing here, goal seeking. So it's adaptation through experience in the service of goals. And we're getting a bit closer to what I mean with, by the term seed. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so here, here we end up through this reasoning path um, with the question, why do we need to talk about causal relations? Well, it's very simple actually, when you think about it, if you want to get stuff done, if you want the light to come on in the room, or if you want to go to the store and buy some bread, you need to know how you need to know some things about the world you're in. You need to know how things hang together. Not everything, just a few things, the few things that are relevant for that goal. Okay. In your world, you are you have some uh, variables and patterns that are manipulatable at some times and not others. And you have some variables and patterns that you can observe and at certain times and not others. And this is what you need to relate. This is what you need to connect in ways that are useful for your purposes. So um, this is essentially what we call causal relations. That's, that's what it means. And frankly, we don't need to go to put on our philosopher's hat and talk about whether causal relations really exist and whether there can be a true cause for something, etc., because intelligence is a practical solution to practical problems. So all we need is to talk is to talk about practical things. And that's also why I share the goal of, I think most of you, with most of you, which is that we want to make machines that actually work. We don't want to do just designs on paper as so-called theoretical ideas that um, are not implementable. Again, I'm going to throw some hypotheses at you now. Um, these are, yeah, I should be halfway through. I, I, yeah, I cannot slow down for a second, so bear with me. Um, <clears throat> So I'm gonna throw some hypotheses at you. I'm not necessarily gonna answer these thoroughly in this presentation, but, uh, but bear with me. Um, I've, taken, I've done a lot of thinking about these and this is what I've come up with so far on the subject. Um, knowledge, of, uh, uh, knowledge acquisition for in a, in a general intelligence needs to be able to identify relevant relations. It's not just causal. What I'm arguing is that causal relations cannot be ignored. They absolutely are a necessity. They're necessary, but not sufficient, okay? Um, this is done by creating models of observed relations, comparing subsets of knowledge and percepts in the form of models through reasoning, evaluating the relevance of any acquired knowledge for at any point in time, bringing it to bear, on the situation and apply it. Um, and if you want to learn incrementally and cumulatively such that as you go and as you do more stuff, you learn more stuff. 
then you have to know causal relations. This is a, an absolute necessity. And these are bootstrapped via correlations, but I will not go into that today. So causation, let me talk a little bit about causation. Um, again, to get anything done, you must know some useful relations of the form A then B. Something particular results in something else particular. Otherwise you can't really predict, but you don't want that to be particulars. You know, if, if I lift this yellow glass, uh, you know, the, the yellow glass will be lifted, you know, uh, or if I grab the yellow glass and I lift my arm, the yellow glass will lift with it. it, it that, that's a very particular thing. You don't want to just be that particular. You also want to have general knowledge. So that means you have to generate useful general relations from your experience. So that's another reason why we need reasoning. We need induction to create these rules. Now, doing something is not the same as observing. And I could observe um, a robot lifting this glass and assume that the robot is thirsty, but my assumption then would be wrong. Um, I, I could, uh, and, it's, and the only way to know that that was wrong would, would, would be maybe to withhold water from that robot for about a week, which is, or what is it, uh, 20 days. Uh, which is the absolute maximum for any living organism to be without water. And then noticing that the robot does not die, assuming its charge is still there, um, I would disprove that model of the world. Now, forgive me for that silly example. I just made it up on the spot. So uh, causal relational models. This is uh, what I'm, uh, this is the name I'm giving these, these, uh, these information structures that hold information about causal relations. Now, uh, again, they're based on experience. We've said that several times. They capture relations between observed patterns and they model relations between variables and, and patterns and elements in any environment. So uh, they are of the form generally, you know, if you have alpha at time t1, then you will have beta at time t1 plus some delta because it a cause cannot happen after an effect. That is not a true causal relation. Um, so the process of creating this knowledge involves coming up with a bunch of ideas for how things might be related in the world and then testing them to evaluate their usefulness. If I have this crazy notion that grasping a glass and then lifting my arm other things being equal, the glass will be lifted. Uh, I can test that. In fact, it needs to be falsifiable for, for me to, to be sure about it. It needs to be such that if I do that and the glass does not lift, I already know just by observing my action, the effect of my action, that that model is wrong. Um, the more accurately these models help a controller achieve goals, the more useful they are. So that's a very simple bookkeeping. Um, and, the, and I just already jumped the gun on this one. So the models must be falsifiable. It must be in a form like scientific hypotheses in a comparative experiment. You need to formulate, so Karl Popper was right. You need to be able to formulate things in a way that can be falsified. Otherwise you cannot be sure that they're correct at all or take that back, that they are useful. Um, now, we, that doesn't mean we can walk around and just create hypotheses about everything. You know, yes, there might be a lot of subliminal uh, 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 subconscious processes that we are not aware of consciously that are going on, but it's clearly bounded. There's no way that we're doing all hypotheses possible for about everything we know. So there must be some way to bound this. And the way you bound it is by practical concerns. Again, intelligence is a practical solution to practical problems. So co-temporal, co-spatial is more important than anything else. That's how you stay alive anyway. Um, so let me just run through uh, real quickly here um, how you can what the process is for creating such useful causal relations. 
Well, it, let's assume that the world only consists of alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, we're going to say that this is an action. It's well, it doesn't matter if it's an actual phenomenon or not. But let's just say that this is a paper and pencil example. Uh, I just told you this is the world. This is how it actually is implemented. It could be a simulation I wrote and run on my laptop. And I know the code, I wrote the code. So that's, I can tell you, this is truly how it is. Okay. Now I bring an agent in and I say, observe this thing. The agent sees um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, events, you know, I, it sees an alpha and then at the same time, it sees a beta and a gamma. And, and then it notices there's a beta again. And uh, lo and behold, there's an alpha and a gamma at the same time or, or roughly at the same time. And so, so let's just say that this agent is a bit sloppy and it doesn't quite pay attention to the timing of events. It com comes up with a set of models um, about the relationship between these phenomena in its world. Whenever I see an alpha, I also see a beta. Whenever I see an alpha, I also see a gamma. Whenever I see a gamma, I also see a beta and vice versa. Four models. Are they useful? Hell yeah. Uh, it can use any of these models to predict what's going to happen if it sees any of these events, okay? Um, it sees a gamma. It says, oh, I bet you you'll have an alpha and a beta too. Yeah, lo and behold, that's true. Um, so any one of these models will predict this world. But if the agent wants to do something in this world, it wants to stop seeing beta. It wants to never see beta again, ever. Well, it could try to use model three, you know, try to get rid of gamma and see if beta goes with it. Well, no, it doesn't. Even if it was, even if it managed somehow to get rid of gamma, uh, that is not how the causal relations work. So it would have to, so this is a way to test its models, essentially, how useful they are. Not just useful for prediction, but for getting things done. So in order to get rid of beta, you have to get rid of alpha that, because that's how the world is rigged. Now, this actually means that the CRMs are bi-directional. And that's a very useful property because when you read them from left to right, they mean that A may cause B. When you read them backward, it, may, it, may, it tells you that, uh, that B may have been caused by A. So if you see a B, you can predict that maybe A was there to cause it. Now, we are familiar with this from AI because, uh, from philosophy and AI, because uh, re reading them forward is deduction and reading them backwards is abduction. And deduction is very useful for prediction and abduction is exact is exactly what we do when we plan. In order to get to the goal, I have to do this first. In order to do that first, I have to do and so on. So that's reading backwards. Um, now, someone asked me a while back, uh, okay, so that's fair, fair enough for rules. Okay, so the CRMs are rules, but what about history? What about events, et cetera? You know, how can I talk with, about events when I have rules? Well, the way you do that is you instantiate the CRMs and you timestamp them. So you have a general rule that says, whenever I see some A, I will see also some B because that's a causal relation. So uh, you instantiate that model and you bind the variables and you bind it temporally. Oh, yesterday I saw an A and, and lo and behold, of course B happened as well. And so instantiated CRMs uh, can be put in your memory as a history trace. So this is, this is what it is, is in fact, it's like a comparative empirical experiment. You, you come up with some hypotheses, you test them when they start to predict well, you perceive the result and you use reasoning to weed out the, the models that only predict but do not allow you to act because th those are no good for planning. And so, um, so try, you know, try telling that to the central bank of many countries in the world because they seem to have all of this jumbled up and they don't understand uh, what empirical comparative experiments mean. Um, 
but that's another completely different story. Now, um, so here are the, the five, six, six last uh, slides in my talk. Let's see if I can do uh, under a minute for each one. Uh, maybe not quite. So here is what happens when you learn. Uh, you have an agent in the world. Some things are novel. Um, and it sees, uh, it sees a, a phenomenon. So this is a phenomenon in the world. Um, it can only perceive certain aspects of the phenomenon because some things are observable at certain times and not others. And um, the things that it's not familiar with, it creates hypotheses about. And as it learns and creates hypotheses and creates models using this hypothesis to you know, generate and test methods basically, um, it's, it's, uh, it's familiar aspects of the world grows and uh, it may or may not change the, the buffer of hypotheses. Some would say as you grow older, you know, you, 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 have, you don't have to create as many hypotheses if you don't want to. So um, uh, that's why maybe it's harder to, to teach an old dog new tricks, but uh, be that as it may, um, that's essentially how it goes. And, and so, the models, because they are, uh, they can be manipulated by reasoning, al allow you to grow this in a very compact, sensible way, systematic way. Now, what about seed programming? Well, I contend and I submit to you that this is simply a uh, a special case of novelty learning, as I've outlined it, where you start off with some sort of a seed. This is what you're born with. So you're born with you know, something in your uh, repertoire of action and perception. And this helps you generate hypotheses in the beginning. But by and large, it's exactly the same process as you go on. Um, it's just that as you grow more knowledgeable, you use less and less of what you were born with and more and more of what you have already learned new stuff. Um, so learning in this view is the systematic creation of knowledge from experience. You're all familiar with that and probably agree with me on that. It's bootstrapped from existing knowledge, whether that's a seed or not, using reasoning to model causal relations and more. And seed programming, Seed, seed programmed learning is a special case of learning bootstrapped from a seed. So the autonomy here comes from the ability to bootstrap causal modeling. It's the only way that you can grow. If you don't learn any causal relations, you cannot possibly get better at learning. But you are assuming that you always have insufficient knowledge because you're always learning new things, remember figuring out how to get new stuff done um, using a combination of, of whatever reasoning method makes sense, ampliative reasoning and systematic testing, recursively using it in subsequent actions and knowledge acquisition. So, and, and so our, our second to last slide, generality comes from the ability to generalize causal models using ampliative reasoning again, especially induction and analogy. Oh, this is sort of like that. Let me see if that works. And test it out by doing stuff in the world through falsifiable actions via abduction and, and deduction, mostly. Uh, in summary, causal knowledge is, is fundamental for practical intelligence. And I submit to you, what other kind of intelligence is there than practical intelligence? Um, for any agent that must figure out how to do new stuff, causal models is critical. Um, so is reasoning. And this is how you enable autonomy in general. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very insightful uh, talk. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, anyone has any uh, quick questions? Uh, I saw there were talk, uh, talk questions in the chat. Um, um, 
the first one is uh, Kristen mentioned gore seeking. Where do those gores come from? Uh, say that again. Uh, uh, he said you mentioned gore seeking, and where do those gores come from? Goals. Mm, where they come from? Yeah. In, in the beginning of the the, yeah. the talk, you talked about uh, goal seeking behavior, and yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering where these goals come from. Yeah. Um, so, if you if you are an agent that's born into a world and you have no built-in goals, you will not learn anything. You will have to have inside of you some sort of a bootstrapping mechanism or drive that essentially bootstraps the learning behavior. Otherwise you will not learn anything. Um, so uh, whatever you call it, it ne there needs to be a mechanism that gets the learning, the knowledge acquisition process started. Now, for an AI, we could easily foresee giving um, uh, a learner anything from a very simplistic goal uh, or drive like that to a highly complex, you know, survival skills, etc. cetera. Um, if you look at nature, um, you see how the difference between uh, some animals and humans uh, is, is quite stark at birth, um, a human uh, baby will die if there's no caretaker. Whereas this is not true for many animal species. Um, and, and, and possibly, uh, or I could be wrong on this, but possibly that's because um, our learning skills are, are targeting more general aspects of the world than, than any other animal species. Um, so in other words, you have to, if, if you want full, let, let's, let's hy hypothesize that there's su such a thing as full autonomy. And if we think of full autonomy as basically just being born into the world and from then on just doing whatever you, you, know, you need to do, um, there, there will have to be some sort of a survival goal there. Otherwise, you know, uh, a complex dangerous world will just kill you. So that's not, that's not fun to talk about. So let's, let's limit ourselves to the agents that are born with a learning bootstrapping method or mechanism built in. So they start to learn. Now, how much do they need to learn uh, depends on uh, a lot of factors. Uh, if it's an AI, presumably you built it for a purpose, you would want to put into it, um, if, if you're gonna send it into outer space, there may come a time when you can't really send any useful information to it. And all you can do is just receive its transmissions. And you would, you would want that, uh, that uh, system to be fairly autonomous. You know, you might wanna give it full autonomy, but you don't want it to mess with its top level drive because that is an undefined state. Um, that is sort of like, you know, when, when, when people uh, do silly things uh, with their own lives, like taking it. But uh, so so that is is, is um, so yeah that's all I I'll have I'll have, have on that for now. I can talk forever. Thank you. That was a good explanation. Uh, the, the 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 other question I had was uh, uh, it seems that the words uh, hypothesis and model uh, are very similar in your mind. Is there any distinction that you have between them? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you know, you can have all sorts of models of, of anything for any purpose. And the purpose of a model um, is kind of inherent in its form. If it's a useful model, it has to reflect its purpose somehow, like, a, like an architect's paper model of a skyscraper. Its purpose is not to test, you know, how, how strong it is. It's, it's not, you're not gonna, uh, put some weights on it and see if it holds up. That's not the purpose of a, of a paper model. The purpose of a paper model is, is for people to look at it. So a model has, has always has a particular or several uh, different kinds of, of purposes that it serves. A hypothesis, a model that's a hypothesis that, that is in the role of hypothesis is a model that is being considered 
for its usefulness. Just like a hypothesis in a comparative experiment.